Father, we are grateful this morning for your presence in this place. Lord, just thankful for our church, uh, for this family that you have uh, made us a part of, Lord, for the blessings uh, that come with, uh, with being a part of that family, Lord, and, and with the responsibilities as well. Father, we realize uh, that each of us has a responsibility to serve, to, to support, to pray for, to encourage uh, our church and uh, our staff and, and, and the leaders in various areas of, of church ministry. So I just pray that we would be mindful of that. And Lord, again, uh, I, I pray that you would remind us today of, of the great joy that is ours by knowing that we have been forgiven uh, and of our sin, Lord, that we are in a right standing uh, with you. Uh, that should give us cause for rejoicing, uh, for bold living, uh, and, and for absolute assurance, Father, that, uh, that one day we will step into the very presence of God in heaven, Lord, uh, where uh, forever we will experience the, the great blessings that you have provided for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray this morning. Amen. Church, nothing can separate us from the love of God. He's the God who stays. Let's all stand up. Somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow 
can separate my heart from, from the, the God, God who stays. stays. Amen. Amen. He is faithful. He is faithful, right? When we're not, he's faithful still. Amen. And he never leaves us or forsakes us. Calvary Kids, join me. Yes, you are. So as we talked about in Sunday school, Psalm 19 points to how great God is. And so we can look at those things and see how great God is. We see the waterfalls and how powerful they are. It gives us a hint of 
of how powerful our God is. And so we're going to learn more about that today. We're going to get more into that in creation and how that points to Jesus. So let's do that and pray. Father, I thank you so much for creation, God. I thank you for the way that you design things, God. Um, Lord, I pray that we can look at creation and be in awe of you and enjoy uh, you through that. Father, we love you. Please speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. God is good, is he not? All the time? All the time. All the time God's good? The goodness of God. Stand together, church. So, so 
with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, when we talk about singing of the goodness of God, that's really what David is doing in this 32nd Psalm. You can turn there with me if you would, Psalm 32. Uh, David wrote these words not only to be a lesson to his fellow Israelites, but to be a word of praise, a word of testimony. That's really what we're talking about when we talk about singing of the goodness of God. We're talking about praising God with our lips, sharing with others, uh, as well as ourselves, um, our praise for this wonderful experience that we have in knowing God as our Savior, knowing that our sins have been forgiven. Last week, we talked about those first two verses in Psalm 32, and David speaks of this great treasure that he has in the forgiveness of God. David was perhaps the wealthiest man of his day. Uh, He had all the material resources that anyone could possibly hope for. Uh, He had fame, fortune. Uh, He was the king. Uh, And yet, he speaks of forgiveness as, as his great treasure, this experience of the blessedness, the the happiness. Remember we talked about that word blessed. It it speaks of happinesses. It it speaks of a life characterized uh, by the the happinesses that come because we know the Lord and because we know that the Lord loves us in spite of our sin and that God has forgiven us. He He has taken away Our sin. And so that's what David writes about here. But in these next few verses that we're going to look at, David lets us know that his experience was not always one of experiencing the blessednesses of God. Because when David sinned, rather than going to God and and just falling upon God's mercy, upon God's goodness, uh, he tried to handle his sin himself. And he tried to handle it by by hiding it. Uh, And as a result of that, he had to endure the the harsh consequences that came uh, and come to all of us who try to hide our sin uh, from God. And of course, this story of David's sin with Bathsheba, it's told in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And of course, we know that... uh, David had brought Bathsheba to the palace. He had had a a night of illicit uh, engagement with her. And as a result of that, uh, soon after, he got word from Bathsheba that she was pregnant. Uh, Not the news that David was hoping to hear that day, because the truth is, uh, David knew that what he had done was wrong. Uh, David knew that Bathsheba was the wife of another man, and not just any other man. Bathsheba's husband was Uriah the Hittite, uh, a faithful servant of the Lord, a faithful servant of the king, a man that loved David and loved Israel and loved Israel's God. He was a a faithful servant, a mighty man uh, among David's mighty men. That was the the man... uh, who was Bathsheba's husband. And so when David found out that Bathsheba was pregnant, rather than going to the Lord, uh, David took matters into his own hands. And the first thing he did is he sent word to the, to the military, to Joab, uh, the military commander, uh, and he requested that Uriah be sent home. 
Uh, there was nothing necessarily uncommon about such an order. Uh, valiant men were often given a break, allowed to, to come home for a rest, uh, to have time with their families, and, and so this wouldn't have seemed completely out of line, but we know that David's motive was not simply to give Uriah a break, to honor him for his faithfulness, his, his, his valiant efforts on the on the battlefield. David assumed that when Uriah came home, that he would go home and that he would, of course, uh, be welcomed by his wife, uh, that he would sleep with her, and then everyone would assume uh, that the child she carried was her husband's. Of course, things didn't work out that way. Uriah, the Hittite, the uh, the honorable and faithful man that he was, Scripture tells us that, that he didn't go home, that he slept in the doorway of the king's palace. And when asked about that the next morning, why didn't you go home? He said, how could I, knowing that my brothers are out there on the battlefield risking their lives, sacrificing for the, uh, the, the, the joys and the blessings that we experience here, how could I go home while they are out there? So David's first attempt to cover his sin failed miserably. Well, then he decided he would, he would do something else. He would try something else. So he invited Uriah the Hittite to the palace for a banquet. Again, David's intention was not simply to honor Uriah and to thank him for his service. Scripture tells us that David gave much wine to Uriah the Hittite, so much that he became drunk, and that was David's intention, and he was hopeful that in his drunkenness, he would somehow forget about his faithfulness to his brothers in the military field. He would go home, and again, the same thing would happen. He would sleep with his wife. When they found that she was with child, everyone again would assume that it was Uriah's child. But even in his drunkenness, Uriah did not go home. So now frustrated, two attempts, uh, David decided to carry matters even a step further. Uh, he sent Uriah back into the field with a note to Joab. It really, Uriah carried his own death sentence back to his commanding officer. Uh, and this command ordered Joab to station Uriah in the very front lines of the battle, the most violent part of the battlefield. And then at a designated time, the military was to fall back to leave Uriah exposed where he would be killed. And indeed, uh, that is what happened. So now David is not only an adulterer, David is not only a conspirator, but he's a murderer. Uh, so when the Bible speaks of keeping silent, David was not simply keeping silent. In his silence, he worked every day. I mean, his mind was just a blur with how can I hide this evil thing that I have done. And so these next few verses that we're going to look at... Uh, are David's testimony uh, of when he finally came to his senses. And of course, it took Nathan, the prophet, coming to David and telling David a story uh, that enraged David. Uh, and then Nathan pointing out to David that you're the one that you ought to be mad at. You're the one in the story that did such great evil. You're the one that took the little lamb of Uriah for yourself. And now you've even sent Uriah into the battlefield to be killed. But David ultimately did what he writes of here. He confessed his sin. So this is his testimony. Uh, of the difficulty, the, the suffering that comes when we seek to hide our sin rather than simply acknowledging our sin, coming to God, uh, our faithful and just Heavenly Father.
who is always eager to forgive us. So stand with me. Let's read these, this, this psalm again. I want to read the whole psalm all the way down through verse 11, and then we'll just look at verses 3, 4, and 5 today. Psalm 32, beginning in verse 1, David writes, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And then, of course, that little note, I didn't read it after chapter or after verse 4, but there and then again after verse 5, that little notation, Selah, and I'll, I'll talk about what that means for us. Of course, we know it means to, to pause and to consider what's being said. Twice in these three verses, David uses that little instruction, Selah. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful today for forgiveness. Thankful, Father, for the joy of knowing that we stand rightly before you. You've declared us righteous. We've been justified in your sight. Uh, Father, I pray, however, that like David, we would not allow our sin uh, to rob us of the joy of our justification, as it inevitably does when we seek to, to ignore it, to, to conceal it. Lord, we, like David, should simply come to you immediately, acknowledging all of our sin, knowing, Lord, that you are a God who is faithful and just to forgive. Lord, your very nature is to forgive. You delight in us coming to you in truth, without deception. Uh, so, Lord, speak to our hearts today. And I, I pray, Father, if there's someone here today, someone watching on our live stream who has never experienced the joy of knowing that their sins are forgiven. The joy of, of being saved. I pray that today, Lord, you would open their eyes to their great need. Lord, I pray that today you would grant to them repentance, faith. Help them to come to Christ in faith, receiving him as Savior and Lord, acknowledging their sin, turning from it, abandoning it once and for all, and experiencing the joy that only you can give a person. So, Lord, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. David wants us to know that there is great joy in being forgiven, great joy in knowing that God loves us, is pleased with us, accepts us, uh, in spite of our sin, I mean, I'm so thankful today. I said that last week, and I probably will continue to say it each week as we continue to look through this psalm. I'm so thankful that God loves me in spite of my sin. Uh, and as I said last week, I would love to say to you that my life of sin ended in 1982 when I gave my heart and life to Christ and became a follower of Jesus. But the reality is that's not true. Even as a Christian, even as a pastor... That doesn't come as too big a shock. Nobody gasp, please. I continue to sin. I continue to need God's mercy and His grace to rely upon the fact that He is faithful and just to forgive. That He continues to see me as one covered in the blood of His Son, Jesus. He does not see me as the sinner that I am. He sees me as the saint Amen. that He has made me to be. So David writes of his silence, his, his conviction. What God does for us is he brings conviction into our life. I don't know about you, uh, but when I begin to think about engaging in some activity that I know is wrong, that I know is a violation of Scripture, I begin to, to sense the conviction of God. Of the Holy Spirit who lives within me begins to let me know that what I'm thinking about doing is not a right thing to do. I thank God for his conviction of sin. David writes of this conviction. He says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. This, this picture that David is painting 
of the heavy hand of God. He even mentions that. He says, through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I, I believe that probably all of us can identify with this, this weight that sin brings into our life, especially when we try to hide it from God or to ignore it, to pretend that it doesn't exist. The truth is we may ignore our sin for a while, maybe even a long while, but God doesn't. You, you realize, again, I think Neil said it last week, maybe the week before, I said it last week. When we come to Christ, receiving Him as Savior and Lord, one of the great first benefits that we experience, again, is this, this weight of sin being lifted from our shoulders and this joy of, of forgiveness and acceptance by the Lord. And, and let me tell you, the forgiveness that God grants to us in that moment, that, that declaration of righteousness that He speaks over us in that hour of salvation, covers our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. We are, we are forgiven of every sin we have ever committed or ever will commit. That's a wonderful thing that we need to understand. But as Christians, we all understand what it is to sin and to experience that, again, the, the reminder of what that, that, that guilt and shame can produce in our lives if we don't take it to the Lord. David was experiencing that. And I, and I want you to notice a couple of things, really, as, <clears throat> as David writes of his experience and the, 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 the way that he describes his life, the burden that, that this hidden sin brought upon him. He speaks here, first of all, of, of a psychological impact. David was a troubled man as a result of his sin with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah, his, his corruption as he sought to hide that sin from his people and from his God. He was, he was troubled in his mind and in his spirit in his heart. David, at, at this point in his life, he was not experiencing the joy of his salvation. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things that he cries out for God to restore. In, in Psalm 51, he said, he said, restore to me the joy of your salvation. David knew the joy of being saved. J David knew the joy of, of walking with God of experiencing the blessings of God, but his, his sin and his, really the the effort to conceal his sin, to hide it from God, uh, it robbed him of that joy. And that's what sin does to us. Sin doesn't cause us to be not saved. I know there are those who would say, you know, if you sin as a Christian, you lose your salvation. You've got to pray and ask God to forgive you and, and be born again all over again. Let me tell you, that's nonsense. But when we sin as Christians, it does rob us of our joy. And if we seek to hide that sin, to ignore that sin, to, to, to try to convince ourselves that, that because we're saved, it doesn't really matter what we do, let me tell you, that, that'll cause us psychological and ultimately physical adversity. David says, for when I kept silent, my, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. David was experiencing what we would call a guilty conscience. You ever experienced a guilty conscience? I've told this story before in church. If my mother's watching, I hope you've heard this before, but uh, uh, your, your son has a guilty conscience from time to time. I always have. Even before I became a Christian, I had a guilty conscience. You know, God kind of builds that into us, doesn't he? And when we were boys playing in our neighborhood, my, well, my parents had bought a house in a neighborhood that was still under construction. There were, there were new houses being built all around. And let me tell you, that provided a great playground for us. We, we played in those, those unfinished homes. And on one particular occasion, uh, I was with a friend of mine, my next door neighbor, and uh, anyway, we were playing in one of these not yet finished homes, and there was, a, there was a box of, I didn't know it at the time, they were roofing nails, just this big box of nails. Uh, we got it into our heads that we were going to hide those roofing nails. And all of these homes on this street were built on pier and beam foundations so you could get down underneath the floor. So there was an opening. 
I got down underneath that floor and my friend handed me that big box of nails and I shoved it way back underneath that floor where nobody could see it. We thought we were so clever, so funny. Well, I went home that day and I was miserable. I had a guilty conscience. I went to sleep at some point in the night. I don't know when. I, I was, I was guilt-ridden, ashamed all, all night long. And I, I will never forget, I woke up the next morning and my bed was right by the window in my bedroom. And I, I immediately pulled back the blinds and I looked down the street toward that house. And there was a police car parked there. Oh, I knew. They're after me. They're, they're coming to get us. We, we, we hid those nails and, and somebody wants their nails. Uh, I'm quite certain now that's not why the police were down there, that car. But, uh, but I had a guilty conscience uh, over a box of nails. Imagine David's guilt. He would committed adultery. He had taken another man's wife to himself. And then he had sent that man out to be murdered. David was under great psychological pressure. Uh, I can't even, well, I can. I would love to say I can't imagine. I, I can't imagine. Uh, silence, his, his attempt to cover his sin, to ignore his sin, to pretend that he, and by the way, David was king of Israel. And, and in the day in which David lived, what he did as a king was not uncommon at all. Kings did this kind of stuff all the time. It, it was completely understood in these societies, expected almost. Whatever the king wanted, he could have. But let me tell you, David was not just any king. David was God's king. He was a man after God's own heart. And church, as Christians, we can't think that we're just like everybody else out there. We're God's children. God's not going to let us get away with our sin, he's going to, he's, well, he's going he's to burden us with this sense of a guilty conscience, a, a grief, a shame over what we had done. Uh, David, again, writes in the 51st Psalm, verses 8, and I think I already referred to, to verse 12, but in verse 8, he says, let me hear joy and gladness. That's what was missing in his life. He had forfeited his joy and his gladness in the Lord because he had sought to hide his sin rather than taking it to God and God forgiving him. He said, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Uh, his psychological anguish was, was like a broken bone, a, a joint out of place. He was miserable. Uh, and yet he continued to try to hide his Sin. We don't even know exactly how long this went on. A matter of months, perhaps. And as a result of that psychological anguish, David began to experience physical difficulties. You know, psychological stress can bring physical stress into your life. It can affect you physiologically over the long term. It's just not worth carrying around a bunch of guilt and shame. It's just not worth it. Not when we have a God who stands eager to forgive. You know, this, this whole story reminds me of the New Testament story of the prodigal son. And of course, in that story, the father is, is the, the character that represents God. And you remember the story. His young son came and said, I want my inheritance now. And the father gave it to him, blessed him. And the boy left home and he went away to a far country where he squandered all of his father's money. But he didn't come home. He tried to fix it himself. He tried to do it without his father's help. And he found himself eventually feeding another man's hogs. The, that was as low as you could go for a Jewish boy. I mean, he was at the bottom of the barrel. But in that hog pen, Scripture says he came to himself. And this is what he said. In his mind, he said, I'm going to go home to my father. And I'm going to tell my father, I'm not worthy to be your son. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. But if you'll just let me come home, I'll serve you the rest of my days as one of your hired servants. And of course, that's what he did. He hopped up and he made his way home. But the scripture tells us that while he was still a long way away, somebody was watching and waiting. It was his father. 
And it's a picture of what God is doing when we sin and we refuse to come to God with our sin, thinking that somehow God is going to just smash us. That's not God's nature. God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. This father was waiting for his son. Finally, the son gets to the house. The father had run to meet him and fallen upon him, so relieved that his son was home. And the boy began his speech. Father, I've sinned against you. And I'm no. And, and somewhere in the middle of that sentence, the, the father wasn't paying attention to the, anything the son was saying. He turned to his servants and he said, go get his robe and his ring and his sandals and kill the fatted calf for this son of mine was lost, is now found. He was dead. And now he's alive. The father didn't even listen to his speech. He had forgiven him already. And that's the kind of reception that awaits us. We, we think that if we confess our sin to God, somehow God's going to be angry with us. He's going to be disappointed in us. David fooled himself for a while, perhaps convinced himself that as long as nobody else knows, maybe God won't even know. God always knows. God knows everything we think and do. The psychological impact resulted in physical difficulties. Now the question is, why would God allow His man, that man after His own heart, why would God allow His children to suffer under this burden of guilt and shame? Why would, why would God build a conscience into us? Well, that's because He loves us. In Job chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, the scripture says, Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore despise not the discipline of the Almighty. He wounds, but He binds up. He shatters, but His hand heals. You see, God convicts us. God, God burdens us with that guilt and shame so that we will turn from our sin and return to Him and avail ourselves of the grace and mercy that he is always happy to dispense. The writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 12, 5 and 6, said, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastises every son whom he receives. When you're experiencing the convicting hand of the Lord upon your life because of your sin, it's not because God is angry or God hates you. It's because God loves you. David finally came to his senses. You know, in 2 Corinthians 7 and 8, this is what, this is what Paul wrote to the, to the Corinthians. He had written them a letter, and he had been pretty stern in his admonition of them. And, and this, is, this is what Paul writes. He says, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I don't regret it. Now this is Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth. This is God saying to, the, to us, I know you're grieving over your sin. I don't regret it. And you know why I don't regret it? Verse 10 says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation. You see, that's God's desire. He doesn't just want us to be miserable, but He knows that a godly sorrow, a godly grief, leads to repentance and ultimately to salvation. So the conviction of sin that comes into your life and mine is a good thing. It's an evidence that God loves us, an evidence that we are sons and daughters of God. So David is under the heavy hand of God's conviction. Verse 5 says, and by the way, if you read this psalm, verse 5 is the, is the longest. It's got more words than any other indicating this is the heart of David's psalm. This is, this is what he wants us to know. As he teaches us, this is, this is what he wants us to know. This is the, the centerpiece of what he wants us to know. He said, I acknowledged my sin to you. He's speaking to God. And I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. What did David do with his sin finally? He went to the Lord and confessed his sin. That word confess. In the Old Testament, this Old Testament, this Hebrew word means to cast off, to, to throw away. Again, you get the idea, that burden of guilt and shame that, that had, had made David weak as if he were drained by the heat of the summer. 
He went to the Lord and he cast it off. He, he cast it upon the Lord. Isn't that what Scripture says we're to do? We're to cast all our cares, all our burdens upon the Lord because he cares for us. That's what David did here. He confessed his transgressions to the Lord. And of course, David uses a repetition of those three words for sin. And so the idea here is that David didn't hold anything back. He confessed all of his sin, all of his transgression, all of his iniquity. He didn't hold anything back. Let me tell you, he was through trying to hide his sin from God. He confessed it all. He came clean. And I, and I also want you to notice this. David confessed his sin to the Lord. You know, from time to time in the church, we hear, I don't know, about people being called upon to confess their sins before the congregation. You don't have to confess your sins before this congregation to be forgiven. You don't even have to come and tell me or, or go tell a priest. Just take your sin to the Lord. That's what David did. He didn't go call a meeting at the temple and confess his sin before the nation of Israel. He didn't do that. He confessed his sin to God. As a matter of fact, he cried out to God in Psalm 51, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. In other words, David knew that he had sinned against Bathsheba. He had sinned against Uriah. He had sinned against the people that God had entrusted to his care. He had sinned against his God. But the one that was the main offended was God himself. Against you and you only have I sinned. David knew that his sin was first and foremost a sin against God. So, there's a couple of things about confessing sin here. That word acknowledged, I acknowledged my sin to you. As a matter of fact, if we could read this in the original language, the words my sin are at the first of that sentence. My sin I acknowledged to you. In other words, David's sin has now become the focus of his attention. In other words, he now knows that this is the problem, my sin. This was not Bathsheba's fault for being out there on her patio taking a bath. Now, this was not anybody's fault other than David's. It was his sin. It was, he was the one who had acted wickedly. My sin, he says, I have acknowledged to you. And that word acknowledge means to admit. He admitted to God. What I have done is a sin. Now, God had already said through Nathan, what you've done is, is wicked in the eyes of the Lord. It's sinful. It displeases God. But now David finally admits it. He admitted that what he had done was indeed a sin. It wasn't okay. And then to seek to cover it up, even to the point of committing murder, corruption, conspiracy, it was not Okay, God, I've sinned. I've sinned against you. Almost as if the prodigal son speaking to his father, I'm, I'm no longer worthy to be this king, this man after your own heart. But that's who David was, and that's who he continued to be. I acknowledged my sin to God, to you. And he said, and I did not cover my iniquity. In other words, all of this covering up of his sin, came to an end. He was no longer going to do that. The, the idea here, when we confess our sins to God, what we are doing, we're not just simply saying we're sorry, but we're saying we're sorry because I know what I did was exceedingly wicked. It was a sin against you, God. It was an offense to your purity. I admit that without reservation, and I abandoned my sin. You know, people all around the world, I think, have this idea that I can come and confess my sin, I can, I can ask for forgiveness, and then go right back about my business, including that sin that I just asked forgiveness for. And that's not the idea, church. True confession speaks of, of, of abandoning my sin. I know what I did was wrong. I know what I did was a sin against Almighty God. I know what I did hurt not only me, but everyone around me. I'm leaving it behind. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm abandoning 
this sin. I'm, 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 I'm leaving it behind. That's, that's the idea here. David stopped denying his sin, revealed it for what it was, and rejected it. And again, in the 51st Psalm, David's great Psalm of repentance, verse 6, he says to the Lord, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. David had not been truthful, not with himself, not with the people of Israel, certainly not with Uriah, not with God. But now he had come clean. He confessed his sin, rejected it, and as a result began to once again experience the the joy of walking with God in forgiveness. I acknowledged my sin to you, admitted that it was wrong, that it was a sin against you. I, I did not cover my iniquity. I, 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 I abandoned that sin. I said, never again. I said, I will confess. And notice the way it's written here. David says, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. It doesn't even say there, I confessed my sin to the Lord. David just determined that he was going to do that, almost like the prodigal son. I will go home to my father and I will say to him, he never really got the opportunity to do that. It doesn't indicate here that David really ever got the opportunity to do it. But the minute he decided in his heart to come clean before God, Scripture says you forgave the iniquity of my sin. There is forgiveness, church. You don't have to carry around a load of guilt and shame. Not about anything. You know, a, a lot of us carry guilt and shame around, don't we? Over something that we did, perhaps long before we ever came to know Christ as Savior and Lord. Perhaps over something that we did after we became a Christian. We might say, well, you know, before I was a Christian, I can understand why I sinned so greatly. But as a Christian, I, I should, shouldn't sin in this way. What sins are you forgiven for? Past, present, future, all sins, all of them. You're forgiven. David says you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I love the New Living Translation uh, account of this verse. It says, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And again, if you've experienced that, and I believe you have, I know I have, it's a wonderful thing to know I don't have to walk around with guilt and shame. You forgave me, David said. All my guilt is gone. David's forgiveness and ours, when we go to the Lord, acknowledging our sin, no longer trying to hide or ignore our iniquity, our forgiveness is immediate, it's constant, it's eternal, it's always, God is always, well again, faithful. And just to forget. It's his nature. We don't have to worry about God waiting around behind the woodshed to give us a whipping. All that grief, psychological and physical anxiety, that was the whipping. God convicting us. Now we come to him acknowledging our sin. What does it say in 2 Chronicles 7, 14? If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. I'll heal their land. Oh, man, how desperately we need to know that God has forgiven us, to experience that joy that comes from knowing that we are forgiven, to experience that, that healing in our life. And land again, 1 John 1, 8 and 9. We're so familiar with it. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And with that understanding, that sense of forgiveness that rushes over us, what happens or what results from that is that we are now set free to serve the Lord. David was God's man. He was God's king. He was the leader of Israel. And yet his sin had kept him from exercising effectiveness in the roles that God had called him to. He was miserable. He was weak. He was, he was weighted down. And now, now he's set free 
That's why I believe that, that Selah is there. Stop for just a moment. He's saying, think about this. Consider this. Don't, don't hide your sin from God. Don't do what I did. Don't try to cover your sin. Ignore it. Treat it like it wasn't a sin at all. Acknowledge it. Confess it. Be restored. Let, let the joy of your salvation be restored. Sila. Forgiveness. Set David free to serve the Lord. And church, it does the same thing for us. It sets us free to serve the Lord. Again, to live our lives, as I prayed at the beginning of this service, with boldness. To know, yes, we've sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. But I'm forgiven. God loves me. God accepts me in the beloved, in Christ Jesus, his son. I'm accepted. I'm a part of his family. I'm welcome at his table. There's a place for me in the Father's house. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? We're forgiven. We don't have to let our failures define our lives. Matter of fact, we're not supposed to do that. Because for us as Christians, for those of us who are in Christ, our, our failures are not final. God's word is final. Justified. Not guilty. Forgiven. Accepted. Loved. Mine. We're God's. So, is there some sin in your life, Christian, that you've refused to admit? Refused to abandon? You think you can just ignore it? Let me tell you. David says you can't, and he's right. You can't. If God's hand is heavy upon you, do what David did. Confess your sin to the Lord. Cry out to God, simply acknowledging your sin, turning from it in repentance, and experience once again that joy, the joy of salvation, the joy of forgiveness, the joy that only one who has been justified by God can really experience. That's the joy God wants you to live your life in. Our God's a forgiving God. He's not mean. He's not angry. He's like that prodigal son's father. He's watching, waiting for you to come to your senses, to come back to him. He'll set you free to experience the joy of his salvation and to serve him as you were called to do when you were saved. Let me, let me pray with you. Father, we are so thankful today for the forgiveness of sin. Lord, so thankful to know that though we have sinned, though we have failed you miserably, um, you still love us. We are still your children. We are still forgiven. Lord, help us to live our lives every day in a manner that would cause us to experience the joy of forgiveness. To experience that relationship that a father and son, a father and daughter are meant to experience. Don't let us go one more minute thinking that we can hide our sin or ignore it. And Father, once again, I just pray, I know there must be someone, someone here, someone watching, someone who will hear this message. If you have never trusted Christ, Never turn from your sin in repentance. Never received Christ as Savior and Lord. I pray that today, again, God would open your eyes to your great need, that he would grant repentance and faith, that he would save you, that you can leave here today rejoicing in the forgiveness that is available only through Christ Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.